Hi, David. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Thank you. What a pleasure to see you. Pleasure to see you. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You're David from, known, no doubt, to many of our viewers and listeners. But just in case, um, I should say that you are a, a pundit, a... A senior editor at The Atlantic. You're, you're and a senior editor at The Atlantic. Uh, you, you worked in the Bush administration as a speechwriter. Uh, you've written a number of books. Any particular book you like to plug these days? Um, I've, I've written eight books. I'm uh, instead of accumulating. I wrote a novel called Patriots in 2012. Mm -hmm. And my most recent book was an e-book called Why Romney Lost, mostly distinguished because it was published on the Thursday morning after Romney lost. That is a fast turnaround time. Well, it, um, as I said, that it, it was... It, it wasn't written. It was just you just press – the thing about ebooks is you write the book uh, and then you press the button. And what is the one-sentence answer to why Ron, the question of why Romney lost? Um, he didn't have a middle-class economic agenda. Yeah, there you go. He should never do that. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to talk uh, uncharacteristically about the meaning of life, not what we usually talk about. We're going to talk more specifically about the meaning of your life because, after all, this is appearing on Meaning of Life TV. Um, so for starters, I guess – Let's answer the basic question. Is there meaning in your life? Is it in my life personally? Um, life person. Well, or we could start with the universe. Is there okay. meaning in the universe? Let's, let's, let's work in toward you. Is there uh, meaning in the universe? Uh, I think our brains are structured. So we're going to see meaning whether it is there or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, in the end, uh, does how much does the, how much does the universe care about any one of us? Um, clearly, that uh, that amount is going to be vanishingly small. But that's not the way we're constituted to be. Uh, we're going to we're going to see meaning, and since that's the way we are, that's the way it's going to be. So you don't think there is any actual transcendent source of meaning or higher purpose or anything? Do I believe there's a God? I do, but do I think? Um, uh, well, then that would be the source of meaning, wouldn't it? The ultimate source? Uh, yeah, although uh, I'm as someone who takes the concept of, of free will pretty seriously, um, I, I don't think um, I, I don't think what God I, I don't think what God is doing for us is um, providing. Uh, I think what God is doing is he he, he equips us uh, to lead lives that our lives of, of purpose for ourselves where we meet, you know, with the opportunity to live up to certain obligations and duties. And if we do that, we feel great sources of, of satisfaction. Um, how transcendent the meaning all is. I'm, I'm very unsure about that. Hmm. Well, and maybe that should lead me to inquire as to, uh, your conception of God. I mean, uh, there are transcendent conceptions of God and then there are, more imminent conceptions of God, and there's downright pantheism, uh, which says that God is nature and nothing more. Where, where are you on that spectrum? Well, I'll give you my, my, my theory of human religion. How about that instead as a substitute? So um, you have children, um, and you send them off to day camp when they're young, and they, they bring home um, pieces of cardboard on which they've glued bits of dried up noodle, uh, noodle art. And we love our kids and we think they're wonderful, but let's be frank, the, their noodle art is, is not only pretty terrible, but... It, you speak for your kids, I'll speak for mine, but, but I, let us stipulate that your kids produce bad noodle art. Proceed. But, and it's actually kind of hard to distinguish from all the other kids' noodle art, but we love them. And so we make a big fuss over it and say, what a wonderful piece of noodle art you brought home. So I think that is basically how God views human attempts to understand him. It's, it's, it's so much noodle art. And to the uh, and it it's not even really very close to being art at all. Uh, and uh, I think that's just, that's the, the nature of, of religion is it's very, it's as it's bound by our own imperfections. Um, and uh, so, and, and meanwhile, there are what, a hundred billion galaxies, something like that. Each of them with a hundred billion stars, something like that. And many of them must have, um, intelligent creatures on it. And if there's one God, they're all worshiping the same God. He's got a lot of demands on him. Um, and uh, a lot of the things we ask him... Oh, he's got a lot of processing power, though, I would point out. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, maybe. But um, uh, he, I, I think a lot of the time he is thinking about us. You guys sort it out for yourselves. Mm -hmm. So you think that there is a God, but as for uh, our ability to conceive of God and exactly what 
he or she is up to. You think that is about as close to the truth as I your think, kids' I think, noodle I, art I, is I, a good art. If, if there's um, if there's any truth uh, to the concept of God as we conceive him, then our ability to apprehend him must be incredibly limited and defective. Okay. But in theory, still, but you, I would think that there would be inherent meaning in aligning ourselves, our behavior, with the values of a God that is worthy of worship, just in a theoretical Yeah, for sure. For sure. But I, I think um, I think that I think that that's both uh, too hard and, and, and I think that we've got an easier job mm-hmm. in life. Um, I think that we're able, whether we believe in God or not, um, to come up with lists of duties and obligations uh, that aren't all that mysterious or hard to figure out. And if we meet those duties and obligations, then I think we lead satisfying lives. Okay, then let's let's move to that discussion. One that doesn't assume a belief in a particular God. So, uh, you know, you know, I gather that you think we can kind of fathom how we should orient our lives morally, yes. ethically, whether or not we believe in a God. So, how 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 does that work? Um, well, you know, a lot of people who are um, deeper and wiser than, than I am have thought about this, but I don't think it's, it's that difficult. I mean, that you, uh, that, you know, we, we, uh, this, whatever society in we're in, there are going to be a series of, of, uh, duties and obligations, some of which are going to be pretty universal care for your children. Uh, some of which will be quite culture bound. Uh, and, uh, and if we meet uh, all of the norms that are universal and the more sensible of the norms that are culture bound, I think that our feeling day to day will be I'm, I'm living a life that I'm that makes me, makes me glad to be alive um, and that allows me to look at the people I love and to see back in them a reflection, an affirmation that I'm, I'm doing right by them. And that will make me feel glad to be alive. OK, so um, so then there's a certain set of things that people all over the world you would think should do to call themselves moral. And those are things like what the golden rule or. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, 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 care for your children. Um, you know, uh, don't um, don't use uh, don't use violence uh, for individual purposes. Um you know, honor your promises and commitments. Um, I, I don't think there's a human society that can exist without without those norms. Um, and then, uh, and then there are a lot of other norms where um, you know uh, you have to bring a certain kind of ox if you're going to worship Zeus. Um, and you know, the, if the enough of the people around you expect to see that ox there on the Zeus feast day, bring the ox. Okay. Um, so, so this is broadly what gives your life. Meaning on an everyday basis, the, there are things that comply with either the universal moral truths you you divine or more culturally bound norms yeah. that are, I guess, in some sense, constructive or healthy. Yeah, and and then and then we, we live, um, you know, and then we build lives of, uh, with of friendship and family, um, uh, community participation. Um, you know, in some ways, this this problem. One of the, the problem tends to one of the reasons we ask all of these famous philosophical hypotheticals, the fat man in front of the streetcar, uh, is because ninety nine percent of the job isn't that ninety nine percent of ethical questions aren't that interesting. <laughs> uh, you mean you've never had the opportunity of flipping a switch and making a streetcar either kill one person or whatever? Right. Uh, so like most of the time, you know, our, our, and and the fact is we see around us lots of people who are failing at duties that are completely uncontroversial. Uh, care for your children. Uh, that's, that's not a complicated moral imperative. And yet people, there are, uh, how few parents do a good job of that. Um, and caring for the, uh, caring for the children also the way the children need to be cared for, not in such a way as to meet the parents own neuroses. Or, um, uh, you know, uh, be a responsible member of, of your community. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Well, how, start by not throwing trash on the street. If you meet, if you have, can go through life and say, you know, I have never thrown trash on the street. And sometimes when I saw trash on the street, I picked it up. Mm-hmm. 
You know, th- these are not, I think, the, du- the duties that, uh, that make life go. If you picked up more than you've thrown, you know? <laughs> um, uh, I've, you know, I, I don't want to reveal too much. Of, no, no, I've been pretty good on the trash front. But, but anyway, go ahead. Um, so uh, and I, I think people will find, if they can look back on it all, they've met, met these obligations that, um, you know, uh, and... You know, and then and then there's some things that are not obligations, but that are um, that allow us. You know, have they used? Have we used our talents? Um, have we uh, both mind and body? Um, you know, we. Uh, you know, have we tested ourselves against things that are difficult? Have we tried to understand things have, to the extent it's in us? Um, have we met physical challenges? Um, have we shown courage when it was when it was called for? Have we shown emotional restraint when it was called for? So you sound like what's called a virtue ethicist in the, in the sense that, I mean, you're not, I wouldn't peg you for utilitarian who's just always calculating, you know, aggregate welfare and how much you're contributing to it. But you, you sound like you're more in the Aristotelian mode of thinking there are human virtues, courage, whatever, and, 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 that, and, and the most practical way to guide yourself through life is to cultivate them. And Yeah. I, I mean, look, I, I think that probably – Norms don't get to be norms unless they pass a utilitarian test, um, and I think that's how they got hardwired into us. Um, that obviously a society in which people did not ha- have the norm take care of your children wouldn't last very long. Um, but uh, but that's not why we do it. That is not subjectively why we do it. We do it because um, it, we feel it's right, and we'd feel terrible if we didn't. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you do think there is such thing as moral truth, for starters, it, that, that's independent of your own uh, your belief in God, or or may not be, but you believe in moral truth. Uh, I mean, I, what, what I believe is, I, th- I think we are built a certain way, um, and uh, if there's a planet somewhere of talking snakes, um, they may not have. Uh, uh, our moral truth. They're, they're not universal in the sense they exist. In, like, I mean, the strongest version of the religious claim that there are things that are true throughout the universe that are true, whether there's a human species or not a human species. Um, I don't know about that. But I think there are things that are true for us and for most human communities. Um, and I think most people probably find more satisfaction and meaning in life when they think about, when they think less about what is the right thing to do and spend more time just doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Do you worry much about uh, our ability to execute? Uh, well, I, I guess I'm, I, I want to ask about human self-delusion. I mean, everyone, everyone says, yes, you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Pretty much everyone says that. Pretty much everyone says one good turn deserves another and people who do bad things should be punished. Where they disagree is on like who's done the good thing, who's done the bad thing. Uh, and and so on, right? So, doesn't the problem go beyond getting people to sign on to a specified set of moral axioms? And, and doesn't doesn't the actual immorality enter the world more subtly in some cases? Oh, yes, um, I think that's a little uh, that's a somewhat different question, though, from the problem of where do individuals get their meaning from. I mean, the. the uh, Questions of morality and immorality come up, um, even in the high. I mean, there's, there's the Antigone problem, right? Uh, you have a duty to your family, you have a duty to your country, and they come into conflict. What do you do? Uh, um, and, and does public morality or private morality come first? Um, uh, so, and those, and, and uh, those, the reason that those are the background to tragedy is precisely because they are irresolvable questions. Are there, are there not questions that can be resolved to universal satisfaction, that something terrible will happen, whatever choice you make? Um, and so and that, so we still think about Antigone all, all of these years later, even though the particular dilemma, by the way, that they face in Antigone is one that's almost incomprehensible to us, uh, to us now. Um, but the, the concept of it. Um, and, but, you know, most of the, of the, of the immoral behavior that we see um, around us is not produced. It's not a conflict of goods. I mean, most of the time um, it's just, it's a failure of people to, um, you know, should I stay at the bar longer and have another drink or should I, 
get home to my wife. Um, that that's not a conflict of, of goods, um, and that's you know every, every, the everyday problem that we face is one of simply overcoming our weaker nature to do the things that will make us happier and that are the right in the long term and that are the right things to do. So self discipline, impulse control, simple things uh, like that. What one, one, one of my children's endless jokes to me is, uh, my my wife will say. You know, your dad doesn't really believe in fun. And the kids will say, of course, daddy believes in fun. He believes in exercise and homework. That's fun. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, actually, what <laughs> what principles do you try to um, imbue your children with? I mean, you mentioned child rearing and how uh, how common commonly it's done badly, I guess. But it seems to me it's actually a pretty complicated business, successful child rearing. And, and it's like good, good intentions are are not enough. Are, are, well, you I, have I, I, have, I have three children, and the best part of that is it teaches you extreme humility about how important child rearing is. They're very different people, um, and uh, my I, my working theory when my working theory through them has been that everything good that my children do is the product of paternal upbringing, and everything bad is the product of the mother's side of the family's DNA. That's a weird coincidence. The way because the same is true in my. <laughs> Um, but what do I try to teach? Um, and what do you try to do? Okay, so we're modern people. So the first, we do what people would not have done 200 years ago. The first is we try to wrap them in feelings of love and acceptance, um, because you know, because things change, and uh, and so that's that's the first thing we do. And then we try to make them. Um, uh, we uh, we try to make them good citizens of their little community and their growing community. Um, try to teach them to uh, love learning uh, for its own sake. Um, we uh, try to give them some sense of, of art and music. Um, we try to um, uh, teach them you know, practical ethics, the right thing to do, tell the truth. Um, and, uh, and, then, and, and then we, um, we also try to give them scope to develop what's in them because uh, they are they're little packets of seeds and uh, you, you know, you can give them the sun and you can give them the water. You can, you can hurt the parent can hurt the child by depriving the seeds of the, of the water and sun they need, but you can't make them be different people from the people they're, they're born to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that makes sense to me. So I forgot to ask you a question. I often ask people, I, uh, which is, do you consider yourself religious, spiritual or none of the above? And I think the reason is because of that early God talk you, uh, right engaged in led me to assume the answer was religious but maybe maybe it's not maybe you're more on the spiritual side if, if that's if that's a distinction you even uh, kind of recognize I, I mean i'm tempted just for the sake of paradox to say i consider myself religious but not very spiritual um that uh that i'm uh you know who else said that i mean to me in this series of conversations is some someone with whom you wouldn't think you have a lot in common at least politically matt iglesias He's That's, the only other person who has answered it that way. So anyway, whatever, whatever that means. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I meet a lot of religious duties, but, um, uh, but, um, I'm not someone who seeks a lot of communion, uh, with the realms beyond those, which I can see. I see. So you go through the practice and the practice is important to you, I guess. I mean, maybe that's an interesting question is how does the, the sheer ritual rituals, rituals are important. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we get meaning from them. Um, that so um, uh, we just passed the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. When you go to a Yom Kippur service, well, before the service, you seek out the people that you um, know and you ask you ask forgiveness for any wrongs you've done. And then at the service, um, you reach out to uh, God through the, these pre-written prayers, and you make atonement for various things that you might have done not to any person, but just in you know your, your pride and your. And is anyone listening? I hope so, but it doesn't matter. Uh, because the uh, the benefit, the, uh, the effect to yourself, to the people you love, to the community around you, is just as powerful even if nobody's listening. So that first thing you said, you, you actually seek out people you know and say, if I've done anything wrong to harm you, uh, forgive me. I didn't realize that that actually happens. That's actually... Uh, oh, that's that, the, the, the Yom Kippur is very clear that uh, Yom Kippur only atones for sins against God, for sins against man. There's no atonement at Yom Kippur unless you've achieved forgiveness from the person. Um, so, uh, you know, if I ran over your cat, uh, 
I can't go to s- synagogue and say, oh, Lord, forgive me for running over Bob Wright's cat. I have to go to Bob Wright and say, please, will you forgive me for running over your cat? Good luck with that. But, but the, well, if it's a cat, I've probably done it on purpose, and then I can't atone at all. <laughs> we're on the same page there. Dog. <laughs> it's a dog. Yeah. Um, so, so, but but you just do it in a kind of, I, I mean, you know, perfunctory way. Do you, everyone you know, like on the day, you say, if, if I've done anything wrong, forgive me, and they go, yeah, yeah. Or, or is it more kind of? No, with, no with our, with, within our family, it's quite a, it's a, uh, quite a ritual that, uh, you know, I just, we sit down with my wife and my children, and we we, we all do it. And, and 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 there are, by the way, often very particular things. So you actually start talking about actual grievances? Well, no, we don't. It's not like Festivus, but you know, there are things that uh, you know. I'll suggest something. You know, I did this, and I've been feeling bad about it, and, and I'd like to know that you're prepared for that. Well, that's healthy. I could use more ritual in my life. Yeah, rich. Ritual is important, you know, ritual is important and modern life makes it easy to dispense with it. But I think a lot of um, our, the feeling that people have of lacking inner meaning, they're actually searching for something that, that they're never going to find. And the thing that would give them the sense of, of inner meaning is more of the outer carapace of forms. Mm-hmm. And, and if you meet the forms, then, then you'll find that the question of inner meaning becomes less gnawing. But the forms need to be kind of communal, right? It's not yeah. like you can just do something in your living room alone, right? That's right. And and look, and, and they and a lot of the and the forms and the, the forms are culture bound. I mean, there are a lot of uh, there are a, a lot of things. I mean, one of the things that is I think really helpful about being Jewish is that uh, uh, the Jewish tradition is very clear. You can be a good person. And go to heaven and see God without doing. Uh, if you're not, if you're not born Jewish, you and you don't keep kosher, God is not going to think the less of you. Um, that there are there are, anim, there are rules governing animals that apply to non-Jews. So and uh, that a uh, non-Jew is forbidden to tear a limb from a living animal. Uh, if, if you do that, you're a bad person. Um, but uh, if you are a non-Jew and you have killed the animal first. Uh, and then you eat it. It doesn't matter. You, know, you are not obliged to kill it in a kosher slaughter way or to follow kosher rules to be a good person. So a lot of Jewish rules are, are recognize their cultural specificity. <laughs> and I think one of, that's one of the um, uh, really helpful things about a Jewish religious upbringing is that you can say, well, you know, we have our customs and they have theirs. And uh, that doesn't make us. Uh, I mean, there's a, there is a, there is a, some traditions of supremacism and ethnocentrism in the Jewish tradition, no doubt. But certainly in, in the modern world, the view is, and you know, and especially in my family, we have ours, and some of them are pretty wacky, frankly. And um, but we do them. Uh, uh, they don't necessarily make a lot of sense, but we do them, and we don't think less of people who don't do them because they are kind of wacky. But for us, you know, my father did them, my grandfather did them, my great grandfather did them, so I'm going to do them. Right, and I think that gets at the. But another thing that's kind of fortunate about being Jewish, but the uh, the kind of almost the autonomy of practice in the in the in the sense that uh, membership in the community is less belief dependent. I yes. mean, there are a lot of people who grew up in Christian traditions and then they lost their faith and now they don't have a communal space. Right. And, right. and so you, you see these things popping up like these Sunday assemblies for atheists. I haven't been to one. Maybe they work. I've got to think it's an uphill struggle, um, right. and and that's uh, you know kind of a tough thing. Right. I, I'm sure. I think there's a Jewish show. I'm now going to forget the preamble, but the punchline is what kind of you know I've lost lost my faith. What kind of excuse is that? Right. Right. Uh, and 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 it's a you know it's a, you're lucky. Uh, yeah. I mean, look. There's a lot about it, and there's a lot about it that is pretty wacky. And and one of the um, uh, and there are parts of, and. and there are parts of it that you can only comfortably live with if you believe that truth evolves through history. I mean, uh, one of my, you don't see them so much in synagogues anymore, but there, there uh, was an edition of the Bible that was very common in conservative synagogues, or the, not the Bible, the Pentateuch, the, or the, the ritual Bible. So that is the five, first five books of the Torah, plus those parts of the Bible that are read um, to supplement the Bible during the weekly service. Uh, and they're edited by... Um, they're published more than a century ago, and they're edited by uh, the chief rabbi of the British Empire, who um, was one of the world's great apologists. And so there'd be a section where God would say, go to the Midianites and slaughter 
um, all of their women and all of their children and all of their animals. And if you leave even one animal alive, a terrible plague will come upon you. And then somebody does spare a kitten and the and then there'll be a footnote, and this is explained. This is a metaphor of the soul's triumph over sin. Um, and the last thing in the world anybody should think about is that this actually applies to actual Midianites. It was ever a commandment from an actual god. And, uh, but one of the things that is true, because the religion is so old, everything is so layered with layers of meaning that allow you. I mean, every holiday, for example. Um, has got a series of meaning, meanings that you're taught as if they are, there's one, they are of deeper and lesser profundity, but they also are very clearly chronological. Um, that one was the original purpose of the festival, and then a later meaning was laid on, and then later and later and later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I should qualify what I said earlier by saying I'm sure there are Jewish congregations in which theistic belief is considered essential, but the point is if you fell away from that particular congregation, there would be a kind of congregation that you'd be comfortable in, right, where the theistic explicit theistic belief was was not such a I, I, I attend a pretty orthodox I'm not at all an orthodox Jew but I attend a pretty orthodox uh, synagogue and uh, I, I'm sure there are members of it who would be appalled by all that I've j- just said but uh, I, they're more to the point there are members who would not be right right okay well uh, uh, one other question I've been asking people in this series of conversations is uh, first to remind them that death is coming um, and Ask them, and this is related to religious belief, because, of course, for a lot of people, the, uh, a major consolation in the face of uh, eventual inevitable death is the idea of an afterlife. That's not such a big thing in Jewish tradition. Um, it's, a bit, it's bigger than you think. Um, yeah, in, in the daily prayer, I mean, uh, Jews, the, the daily prayer includes a, st- a, a statement of faith and bodily resurrection. Um, and that's repeated. Many, you, know, you keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. And, um, and in fact, the, the Christian, uh, the, the ideas that begin to circulate in the time of Jesus and his disciples are very much the common, uh, they're not the emerging ideas within the Jewish world of his time that have entered into, they're not as central, I agree with you, but, uh, but it is orthodox. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you're supposed to believe in a, bo- a final judgment and a bodily resurrection. Hmm. And is there a conception of a, of a heaven and a hell in, in the Christian? It's, it's much hazier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but uh, th- there's a conception of judgment, of a final judgment. Does that inform the way you approach either life or death, that, I, that idea? Or? I, I, I have to say, I have never heard, except from the Mormons, a description of an afterlife that sounds in any way attractive to me. <laughs> um, that... So it's like so, that, that talking head song, heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. Yeah. And, and the other point is we're disembodied spirits and we're, you know, that, and the, you know, Jesus is very clear. There's no marriage in heaven, right? You don't, your, your wife is not going to be any more important to you in heaven than anybody else's. Well, like I'm really not interested in an afterlife unless I can spend it with my wife. I mean, I'm really not. Um, and, uh, if the idea is that we're we're going to be like two puffs of wind moving around, um, that's you know, uh, and there are no pets. Uh, they're, they're, I understand there are pets in the Mormon heaven, so it, 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 I, I've never done the research that caused to convert. And I will say, I think a lot of Christians. I, I think a lot of Christians. Uh, what's that? If that's true, if there are pets in Mormon heaven. I'm signing up. I'm definitely going to e- convert either to Judaism or Mormonism after this. I just have to decide which one. I don't know <laughs> what your, your pet policy is. But the, the, um, uh, but I, the, it, there are a lot of Christians, certainly, who believe that they're going to be uh, with their spouses in, in heaven. I think yeah, Jesus is pretty firm that that's not true, though. Well, you know how these ancient figures are. They say a lot of things. You've got to pick <laughs> and choose. Um, okay, so anyway, just the, in wrapping up a little more about about death, perhaps. So given the fact that you're not really uh, thinking about an afterlife, looking forward to one, um, how do you, well, maybe the approach, the best approach is just not think about death. But if you do think about it, is there a way you console yourself in the face of it? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, when, when you're younger, it seems a much more terrifying prospect, I think, than it does uh, when you're older. I mean, I think we, we, do see it coming and we accept it. Um, uh, you know, my consolation, my final hours, I, I hope will be that I won't have left anything unsaid that, uh, I will have left none of the people I love in any doubt 
uh, that I love them, that to the extent of my ability, I've, I've made provision for them, and I know that they're secure uh, after I'm gone, um, and that I've uh, done in my public life um, some good, um, done works of charity, um, uh, played a part in my community, not not let you know left the world a you know somewhat cleaner and tidier place than it would otherwise have been, and that, that'll be uh, what else. You know, what else is there? I think, and um, there's something kind of megalomaniacal about about wanting more, um, that wanting our actions to have eternal consequence. I mean, they, I mean, I think I suppose that's literally true. If you have a baby, and the baby has a baby, and the baby has another baby, yes, your action has an eternal consequence. But you know, we ourselves are going to be forgotten so soon, and those of us who aren't forgotten are going to be so misunderstood that they might they might be happier being forgotten. That is actually true. So, so you're kind of down on on putting a lot of emphasis on legacy. It sounds like. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I think you know, for your the, the legacy of making sure that you know um, your your life insurance is paid up, mortgage is paid off, um, kids are kids kids are educated and debt free. I mean, those, those things, uh, yeah, those are legacies. Um, uh, see in this in the sense of you know how long my work will be remembered that kind of thing yeah well um which is only a concern to a very small subset of the human species to begin with because most people aren't in the business of writing and, and doing things like that but right and also you know you look, uh how there are a lot of things that are remembered um uh for ill or even for derision i mean you know uh Whoever invented flog the phlogiston theory, you know, he's remembered, uh, and you know that we and his his work is held up to mockery in science classes for for now and for a long time to come. As long as they spell his name right. <laughs> well, I don't. So, um, but I, I think that uh, you know that, and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, most of that desire for remember it usually ends up. It usually ends pretty. Pretty badly, and and you know I'm I'm very interested I'm a, interested in history, and you just think you know how well you know we remember the people who have left behind misery. I mean, Genghis Khan remains a celebrity to this day. Um, you know uh, how many people know the name of the man who proved the cholera, how cholera was caused, or even how many remember the dozens of obscure civil engineers who put in um, safe and reliable water piping so we wouldn't have it anymore. Right. And, and there are, I mean, you can distinguish between the legacy that's associated with your name and the, and the legacy just in, in, in the sense of all the influence you have as it passes down through the ages. And everyone has that latter kind of legacy. And I think you're, yes. I think you're mainly saying don't get fixated on the former kind of legacy. Right. No, I mean, anytime you teach somebody anything. Um, uh, nice thing. I mean, doing nice things tends to pe- put people in a mood such that they do nice things to other people and so on. Right. And, and, and if you've learned, and if in your life you've learned anything, pass it on and you know, uh, one, um, you know, be careful because you don't want to sink into senile reminiscence in your old age and, you know, be one of those hectoring old people. Um, um, I mean, you know, one of the most important pieces of wisdom for the old is to know, uh, well, how'd you get so smart? Well, by making mistakes. Well, so keep quiet as you watch somebody else making the mistakes, they'll get smart too soon enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we've about figured it all out, David. <laughs> I have to watch yours, though. I haven't heard your theories on all of these things. That is, uh, you know, it's funny. Nobody has seen fit to interview me. I, I'm not. Uh, I have not been deemed worthy of being interviewed in this particular way. You know, but you you think about all of these issues more than anybody. It's true, I do, and maybe that's why no one's interested in interviewing me because it's not a very productive way to spend time. No, you should. You should. Uh, so maybe do it as a monologue. I'll Just, interview myself. Yeah. I'll interview myself. I'm sure that that would draw a vast listening and viewing audience. Well, there are only about 11 people listening to both of us right now. So. No, now. Don't <laughs> sell my uh, platform short. I want, I did, that is not a comment on your platform. That is a comment on my, my the amount of interest. On you your drawing this. power. Well, you're too modest. Uh, that is something that I do not hear of. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and perhaps never non-ironically. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mother. That was, that was thank, interesting. Thank you, thank you for Before sharing this. As they say. To think about things I don't think about that much, so thank you. I know, but but really seriously, thank you uh, for sharing because non ironically because uh, it is it isn't easy to talk about this stuff. But you've you know you've opened up as people have been surprisingly willing to do, and and uh, it's a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Thank you.